COPD is a condition that affects an estimated 16 million Americans and 300 plus million people worldwide. So what exactly is it? And as SLPs, is this something we need to understand? While it might seem like COPD is just a condition that deals with the lungs, this disease is a lot more than that, and it can significantly affect swallowing, voice, and cognitive communication functions. In this video, we'll be talking about exactly how COPD affects the work of medical SLPs. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. Number one, what is COPD? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is a term used to describe inflammatory lung disease that obstructs airflow from the lungs. The term COPD encompasses emphysema, chronic bronchitis, airflow obstruction, and chronic refractory asthma, per the Mayo Clinic 2017. COPD is a progressive disease typically characterized by an ongoing cough that produces a lot of mucus or sputum, shortness of breath, especially with physical activity, wheezing, and chest tightness. It is difficult to determine the exact impact of COPD worldwide due to the variety of testing and diagnostic criteria available. Best available evidence suggests there are approximately 16 million Americans and over 300 million people worldwide living with COPD. It is most commonly caused by exposure to tobacco smoke, including secondhand exposure. Other risk factors include chemical exposure, age, and less commonly, genetics. COPD is a progressive disease. There are four stages of COPD. Stage one is mild COPD, where lung function is starting to decline, but it may not be noticed. Stage two is moderate, where symptoms have progressed with shortness of breath developing upon exertions. Stage three is severe. Shortness of breath becomes worse here and COPD exacerbations are common. Stage four is very severe COPD. At this point, quality of life is grave impaired and COPD exacerbation can be life-threatening. The COPD Foundation continues to advocate for broader staging definitions of COPD to help recognize COPD before airway limitation develops. That's low 2019. I remember giving the three ounce water challenge to a patient I saw in inpatient rehab that had a stage three COPD diagnosis and was recovering from a significant exacerbation and resultant hospitalization. As a new clinician, I couldn't figure out why she failed the three ounce water challenge. Why would this woman have possible signs and symptoms of dysphagia? She only has COPD. Keep watching to learn just how COPD can affect swallow function and more, and what I did next with this patient. Number two, what does COPD have to do with SLP? As SLPs, we may find our services beneficial to individuals with COPD as they experience things like dysphagia, poor respiratory strength and coordination, dysphonia, and cognitive impairment secondary to hypoxemia. Let's talk a bit more about what to expect during your dysphagia assessment with a COPD patient. A systematic review by O'Kane and Grower in 2009 indicated an incidence of dysphagia within this population to be as high as 80%. This number, taking into consideration the potential impact of COPD on cognition and communication, demonstrates a need for SLPs to be a part of the regular screening process for individuals with COPD. Symptoms are highly variable between patients. Common characteristics of dysphagia in the literature include high co-occurrence of cricopharyngeal dysfunction, reduced laryngeal vestibule closure and ability to clear the airway of aspirate, reduced laryngopharyngeal sensitivity, reversed breath swallow breath patterns, where instead of exhaling after the swallow, a patient with COPD exacerbation is more likely to inhale after a swallow, increasing the risk of aspiration, and increased scores on the reflux symptom index and reflux finding scores. Put simply, COPD affects breathing and swallowing coordination, laryngopharyngeal sensitivity, and more. Poor respiratory support and LPRD or GERD can also result in dysphonia and dystussia. Okay, so that's a lot I just unloaded all at once. Ultimately, it's important to understand that SLPs can have many roles with this population. From dysphagia to cognition, you are relevant in their care. Remember my patient who had COPD and failed the three ounce water challenge? During her fees, I could see that she had post-cricoid hypertrophy, indicating reflux-related changes. Her reflux was unmanaged at the time. She had small amounts of aspiration with sequential drinking due to mistimed laryngeal vestibule closure and discoordination of breathing and swallowing. She also had a weak cough function to eject aspirated material. All things SLPs can help with. 
I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't want to miss. So make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, do you have any specific questions about COPD and the MedSLP role? Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. Make sure to stick around to the end to claim a freebie or two as well. Number three, let's talk about treatment. Like all things SLP, your treatment is going to vary based on your assessment and any necessary imaging. This applies to our patients who have COPD plus voice disorders, cognitive communication deficits, and of course, dysphagia. Let's start with dysphagia treatment considerations. It's critical to develop your treatment plan of care based on the results of an instrumental swallow evaluation especially given the increased risk for silent aspiration with this population. Patients may benefit from rehabilitative exercises, compensatory strategies, or a combination of both. It's important to also consider their breath swallow patterns and if they become oxygen hungry. The interesting thing about COPD is that it's not uncommon for lower oxygen saturation levels to be normal. We're so used to seeing 95 to 100% O2 stats as the norm, but when it comes to patients with COPD, might be perfectly normal for them to be sitting at 90% O2 instead of 100%. It's not uncommon for the oxygen saturation goal of a patient with COPD exacerbation to be somewhere between 88% and 92%. This is because these patients have a harder time dumping CO2. If you give a patient more oxygen, it can increase the levels of retained CO2, resulting in hypercapnia respiratory failure. Hypercapnia is basically when there's too much CO2 in your blood. So remember, Giving patients with COPD more oxygen can be dangerous in some situations. So don't be shocked if a patient with COPD is hovering between 88 and 92% at bedside. Now let's look at dysphagia rehabilitative exercises. One dysphagia exercise to consider with this population is training the exhale, swallow, exhale pattern. Remember, individuals with COPD are more likely to have a breath swallow pattern of inhale, swallow, inhale, instead of the typical exhale, swallow, exhale. Bringing this to their attention and retraining this protecting swallow breath pattern may be helpful. A meta-analysis and systematic review by Patchett and colleagues in 2017 suggests there may be a benefit to the use of expiratory muscle strength training, EMST, and the treatment of dysphagia for adults with COPD, but that further research is warranted. It's important to adjust dysphagia exercises based on deficits and individual patient-by-patient -patient cases. Stick around for a freebie where you can dive more into this topic. What about compensatory strategies? Is there anything SLPs can consider for patients with COPD? Absolutely. One strategy is an energy conservation technique. We can ask patients to rate their energy or perceived exertion using a rate of perceived exertion measurement tool. This can help patients better monitor their energy and endurance during meals. Other common strategies include upright positioning, clearing the airway at least one hour before eating, Maintaining a diet of easy to chew foods to help conserve energy, eating five to six small meals daily, purse lip breathing, behavioral and dietary management strategies for reflux, plus medical interventions for gastroesophageal reflux disease. COPD exacerbations are twice as high in patients with GERD symptoms as those without. So reflux management compensatory strategies can be beneficial. Let's talk about a case study. Remember that patient we mentioned earlier, the fees revealed, aspiration with thins during sequential swallows, with inability to eject the aspirated material fully during a volitional cough, increasingly frequent aspiration as the meal went on due to fatigue, post-cricoid hypertrophy consistent with LPRD and GERD-related changes. What strategies or exercises might you suggest? Energy conservation strategies would be the first thing I'd look into. Educate the patient in choosing softer foods to reduce effort and eat smaller meals throughout the day. I'd also consider EMST to improve cough function, single sips to reduce aspiration with drinking, and I would want to collaborate with the physician for reflux management. I've got a free gift for you over at MedSLPCollective.com. You'll get instant access to our free MedSLP Collective clipboard kit, which includes a resource on COPD, dysphagia exercises, and considerations on page 54. You can also check out episode 23 of the Swallow Your Pride podcast, where Eric Blicker shares his knowledge on the link between COPD reflux, and dysphagia. Head over to metaslpcollective.com now to get your hands on this. The link will be in the description below.